On the phone, pleasure to welcome to the program Lori Wallach. She is the Director of Globalization and Trade for Public Citizen. Uh, welcome to the program, Lori. Thank you very much. Did I get your uh, Did I get your uh, title correct? More or less. It's Director of Public Citizen's Global Trade Watch. It's a division of the national organization, and we do all things trade and globalization. Uh, Tradewatch.org is our website, so I think you got it right. Oh, great. And um, so let's talk about this uh, Trans-Pacific <laughs> Partnership. Um, what we know about it has come basically from leaked memos. Is that right? Well, the tidbits of information that have come out from other countries' negotiators, from leaks of several chapters, one that pharma loves jacking up medicine prices, one that promotes offshoring, and one that promotes attacks of domestic laws and international tribunals. Unfortunately, most of the agreement remains under lock and key, and we only know tidbits, like some members of Congress got the U.S. negotiators to admit the agreement would ban Buy America procurement. So the bits of it we know, part of the iceberg that's out of the water is a horror show. Okay. But there's so much secrecy, who knows what still lurks. All right, before we get to the specific provisions that we know about now, um, how long has this, uh, this trade deal been in the works? Well, that's a philosophical question, which is to say George W. Bush launched negotiations on the Trans-Pacific Partnership in 2008. But what this agreement is, is basically the leftover of a attempt that was started actually in the 90s to impose these kinds of radical corporate rights and permanent constraints on government regulation using trade agreements. And there were a whole batch of them that were regional attempts effectively to expand the NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement model. So they all were derailed when civil society and various governments realized what they really were, not about trade. There were three or four countries left in the Pacific Rim, Singapore being the leader, who decided to revive one of those. And then George Bush jumped in. So depending on where you want to predate it, it could, it could be starting in 2003. We got in in 2008. Obama originally was pushed by Congress to stop participation, uh, ostensibly to figure out his own approach that would implement his campaign commitments to replace that old damaging trade agreement model. But by the end of 2009, the U.S. negotiators were back right where Bush left off. And since then, they've made proposals on things like access to medicines that actually are worse than what the Bush folks had on the table. All right. So ostensibly, how is this, uh, how, how is this sold? Uh, I mean, what, what, are, what are ostensibly the advantages uh, that we would get from such a, a trade agreement? And, 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 and tell us, who, uh, who exactly are the other partners? Well, first of all, the way that this has been branded to be sold to us is as a trade agreement. But that really is false advertising. There are 26 chapters of this proposed agreement, and only two of them actually have to do with real trade, stuff moving between countries and removing barriers to that. The other 24 chapters establish all sorts of new corporate rights and privileges and, and, and or limit government regulation. For instance, there's a whole chapter on financial services. It explicitly forbids countries from banning risky financial goods or services. It specifically bans the use of capital controls, the best tool to avoid risky sloshes of money that cause crises. It explicitly limits the right to regulate a financial institution on the basis of its size. Or there's a chapter on procurement. It bans by America. It's subjects to challenge any government purchasing program that gives preference based on the environmental standards of a product or labor rights. There's another chapter that limits food safety and inspection. There's another chapter on copyright that slips in part of SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act, the things like criminalizing unintentional small-scale copying. So all of these other chapters would lock in permanently with strong enforcement all these rights and all these limits on regulation. There are currently eight countries at the table. Two more have signed up. Those are Australia, Brunei, Chile, Singapore, New Zealand, Peru, Brunei, and the United States, Malaysia. There is also going to be Vietnam is added in, and there is also going to be Mexico and Canada. 
And the, the countries have been doing this behind closed doors with the Obama administration for three years. This is coming up next week. It's the 13th round of negotiations. And now they're in a race to try and get it done before anyone realizes what it is. Interesting. And, and, so, and, and so let's talk about how the, the mechanism so that people can understand how it is that these, um, how it is that our domestic laws and presumably uh, Canada's and Australia's and Vietnam's and uh, Brunei and all these other uh, partners, how the domestic laws become superseded by w- essentially this new regime of regulations, or we should say in many respects, sort of anti-regulations. Uh, how does that how does that process work? Right. So the way to think about this is not as a trade agreement. And by the way, you asked what do its proponents sell it as? They sell it with the usual mantra: it's free trade. It will expand exports. Which actually, our current free trade agreements are export growth rate to the countries we have the deals with is half of that to the countries we don't. But putting that aside. What it really does is not trade. It's a delivery mechanism for all these other policies. So practically how it works is the first chapter will have a provision that is, if not word for word, very close to, this is from a previous one, signatory countries shall ensure the conformity of their domestic laws, regulations, and administrative procedures with the attached agreements. And what that means practically is that all existing and future domestic policies have to conform to the constraints and give the privileges to corporations that are established in the agreement. And it's actually enforceable, unlike a lot of other international governance regimes. It's enforceable because, number one, it sets up a tribunal system where any signatory government can sue another signatory government saying that a specific law or policy violates the constraints or the rights guarantees, and a tribunal of three trade experts, not experts on whatever the underlying health or labor law is, decides if it meets the agreement's rules. There is no judgment about whether it's a good idea. The question is, does it meet the rules? And these rules have a lot of bad retrograde requirements. And if it does not, the country who has the outstanding law has to either change or get rid of the law, or they face perpetual trade sanctions until they do. It's enforceable global governance. Now, that would be bone-chilling enough, but last week's leak of the investment text, investor rights, of this proposed agreement shows that, in addition, it would have a parallel enforcement system that would literally privatize the enforcement of the agreement raising individual companies or investors to equal status with sovereign nations to enforce a public treaty. Translated, this would empower individual investors and corporations to sue our governments, skirting our courts and our laws, to sue them before tribunals of three private sector attorneys who rotate between being the judges and representing the corporations suing the government, And they could sue claiming that the governments must pay them, compensate them, unlimited amounts from the Treasury if any government policy or action undermines the investors' expected future profits or the new rights they are provided in the agreement. This is like a this is like a bad science fiction uh, dystopic uh, dystopic uh, vision of of the future, and uh, so let's so let let me let's see if we can walk through how this would work. For instance, like this by uh, like like the uh, uh, by America. Now that is a um, that is legislation that basically says if the U.S. government is going to pr- uh, uh, buy certain products. Uh, you have to buy it if it's made in America first. Is that correct? That's right. There are exceptions if it's not made here, if right. it's 50% more expensive. But generally, that's right. The preference goes to reinvesting our tax dollars back into our own companies and communities. So, for instance, okay, we've got to buy uh, uniforms for uh, this agency. And um, the, the price of uh, the uniform maker in uh, the United States is within, uh, comports with this legislation. It's not 50% higher. We're going to buy it from them. But I, uh, as a... Um, uh, as a Vietnamese uh, company, 
Vietnamese company, okay. huge apparel tech, uh, exporter. I am a Vietnamese uh, company. In fact, I'm not even the Vietnamese company. I'm an investor in the Vietnamese co- uh, company. You're a Chinese state-owned enterprise, a Chinese government company that is using the cheap labor in Vietnam. That's you. And uh, we start getting into the uh, making uniforms for uh, for agencies business. We go, we put a bid in, and um, we say we, we want it. We don't, we, we, want, we don't get it, and we, I, as this Chinese investor in this Vietnamese company, now have the ability to go to a three-person uh, panel and say, I, when I invested, the business plan that we had showed that we would have these type of profits based upon selling to uh, the United States, or to Canada for that matter, but in this case, the United States, and um, I, I'm out this money, I'm going to sue you, I want that money. Is that basically what happens? That is correct, and the U.S. taxpayer would be on the hook. That is correct. Now, under NAFTA, there is a smaller version of this crazy corporate tribunal system. The text that leaked for the TPP last week shows, horrifyingly, that the U.S. government is trying to expand the scope of the system so that it would exactly cover the scenario that you just described. Right now, it doesn't cover procurement. It covers a lot of other horrible things. Under NAFTA, corporations have been paid almost $400 million in attacks on toxic spans, zoning policies, timber policies, etc. But the push in TPP is to make it possible to do exactly what you said, private enforcement on procurement contracts, but not just that. Also, going to the corporate tribunal to enforce for a foreign investor natural resource concessions on federal land. So Bureau of Land Management, Western Lands for mining, timber, grazing. The U.S. company on one tract of land has to follow U.S. laws, do what they're supposed to for the environment, etc. The foreign company next door under TPP would not have to follow our laws, would not have to go to our courts, but rather could extract our tax dollars out of our treasury as compensation if some government action undermined their expected future profits. This is what the U.S. is pushing for in TPP. Now, this sounds like dystopian, crazy, sadly it's true, but you got to ask, how the heck could something this lunatic get this far? And that's where the secrecy comes in. There is unprecedented secrecy. And so the remedy of this thing and the way it does not ever go into force is we have to air it out. It's like Dracula. we got to drag it into the sun. And, and, and to that end, uh, I know that uh, four U.S. senators, I believe it was uh, uh, just, I guess it was yesterday, um, uh, sent a, uh, a letter to the Obama administration. Sherrod Brown, Jeff Merkley, Ron Wyden, and Robert Menendez sent a letter to the Obama administration asking for greater congressional access to the negotiations. Um, give me your sense. I mean, how? When this stuff leaked and uh, last week, and there was a brief mention, I think, in the, in the, in the, in the news uh, of this, what, what was the Obama administration response? Uh, is it just complete silence? Is it, oh, you guys don't really understand what we're doing here? Or, or, or what is, have they even had to mount a defense? So far, they have not really had to mount a broad public defense. When this issue, because the secrecy, let me just put this in perspective. Current agreements are typically not a very transparent process. But, you know, even the World Trade Organization post-draft texts, and the last time there was an attempt to do one of these grandiose corporate rule agreements, which was called the Free Trade Area of the Americas, at this point in the negotiations, the whole text was made public by the governments, etc. Now, when this issue came up of the extreme secrecy, a month ago, the trade representative, the head U.S. trade official, a guy named Ron Kirk, when the press said, you know, there have been all these letters and demands and people really want to know what you're doing these past three years, he said, literally, well, the problem is the last time we published one of these, the Free Trade of the Americas, once it was public, we couldn't finish it. Now, that's the U.S. top trade official basically saying the only way to ram this past the public in Congress is to make sure the people who are going to live with the results don't know what it says. This is not a good thing, though I'm glad he had that moment of candor. Since then, it got worse, because after that comment, Senator Wyden, mind you, he is the chairman of the committee in the Senate 
with official legal oversight responsibility and jurisdiction for the TPP, his staff, who had security clearance, was denied access to the text. So Senator Wyden said, okay, you're not going to let my staff see it's outrageous. I want it in my office. I want to see it now. And the trade representatives said, you, Senator Wyden, chairman of the Senate Trade Committee, you can't even see the U.S. proposals, much less the draft text. At which point, Wyden, who's voted for all of these agreements, it's not like he was a critic. He just wanted to see what was in there. He filed legislation in May, the end of May, demanding access for members of Congress. I mean, can you imagine that? They want to sign an agreement that would bind and limit, control, undermine swaths of U.S. law. And they don't want any member of Congress to see it until it's too late, and it's signed and it's in a force. I mean, as I look at, at the different aspects of this, um, and, and, and I want to also talk just a little bit more of, um, of the, the SOPA aspect of this, uh, and, and also the, the, uh, the increase and the, uh, in, in the cost, the potential increase in costs of medicine and the, inten- uh, the uh, potential decrease in access to these medicines. Um, <coughs> It, it, I mean, it seems to me that uh, there is a real opportunity for broad, I would think, I mean, broad uh, um, uh, opposition to, to this, I mean, even across the, the, the political spectrum here. And that's got to be the, one of the biggest reasons why they don't want this out in, in detail. I mean, I could imagine uh, even some, uh, you know, Tea Party, the, the Buy America thing. Uh, would at least, uh, you know, or or the notion that you know this is the the one world government that we hear many on the right are afraid of at the at the UN. This is in fact what we're talking about when we when we say a one world government. It's not really a government. It's just a one world sort of corporate understanding that um, we're not going to allow any one particular country to in any way uh, curtail our profits. That's. It's, yeah, that there should be left-right, very powerful unity on the foreign tribunals and raiding the Treasury and on the ban and by America. And the question really is, will there be a sufficient public debate that the rank-and-file members of the Tea Party, grassroots conservatives, will learn about it? Because as we saw in the past with the trade debate, the leadership of the Tea Party is so... Uh, basically on the tab of the big corporations to fund their organizations, that they're simply not willing to cross the big corporate interests, and every single one. I mean, this is like a one percenter's love fest. There's something in there for every single one of them. Big tobacco, pharma, agribusiness, the chronic offshores of America, manufacturers, you name it, they're in there loving it. So the, the National Tea Party organizations have been very quiet. But when this issue, on its merits, gets into the discourse of the conservative grassroots, people go crazy. It really is something that is not partisan. It goes to fundamental aspects, without being dramatic, of democracy. It's like a really quiet, slow-motion corporate coup d'etat. You may think it's not a bad idea to have some of these substantive policies, but no matter how conservative you are, you like the idea that if there's an election here, or if your view changes, you can change the law. But this is like super glue. You have to have every country agree before you can change any of these rules. So it's not just enforceable corporate government. It's actually quite permanent. Uh, it, t- talk to me about the, um, uh, the, 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 the uh, Internet freedom uh, perspective of this. Right. So the, the, amongst the various chapters is one on copyright, and the copyright chapter has some of the same, I would say, outcomes, not exactly the same mechanisms to get there, but some of the same outcomes as SOPA. For instance, the way it works, because remember, every country has to conform their domestic law to the actual agreement, so the the... The requirement is, for instance, that a country put into place criminal sanctions for non-commercial small-scale copying, which is, you know, what SOPA did. It basically would make us all liable personally every time we basically had a, you know, a buffer copy get made off of something that we were copying that was legit. And the, the 
rules in it would also shift liability to Internet providers to snoop on us or throw us off of, of their systems. So it has the same kind of undermining effect of both shifting this extreme liability to a user for things that happen all the time. I mean, the same stuff on breaking a digital lock is in there. But, you know, anyone uses Linux, when they buy software that's kosher and you bought it, you still have to break the digital lock so it'll run on that operating system. So things that we all do that are normal behavior that the big content monopolists don't want us to be able to do because they want to charge us per the click, um, they have gotten ways to make countries implement the worst parts of SOAP in their domestic laws. This has actually caused a big pushback. And it, I, while everyone's totally depressed and horrified, you should know, while sadly the U.S. is pushing a lot of this stuff, Australia has said we will not be submitted to the jurisdiction of the corporate tribunals. New Zealand and Australia have said we will not have new rights for pharma to attack our drug pricing formularies. All of the countries, Vietnam, everybody, have said we will not have the U.S. patent extensions to jack up medicine prices for big pharma that you're pushing. A variety of countries has ha- said no to the mini SOPA, the SOPA through the back door, the son of SOPA. So there are a bunch of these issues, a bunch of countries that have said no on the financial deregulation parts of it. And so there, there is fight back. The problem is, you know, a lot of this agreement's gotten done behind closed doors, so we're in a race against time. And, and if and, folks go to tradewatch.org, you can get information in more detail on each of these issues. And it, it, uh, do these uh, different countries, uh, do they have the ability to opt out of different provisions? In other words, can these provisions s- survive uh, for two or three of the partners and not, and not, and not the others? Or is this something that uh, the, the provisions have to be uh, multilateral or, uh, or actually an, uh, unanimously accepted? Right. That's a very good question. So as a legal matter, the position of the U.S., among other countries, is that for the core provisions, everyone has to be in except while the U.S. is saying that and all the other countries are kind of saying that, every country has something they don't want to be bound to. So just for instance, politically now, Australia said we're not going to have these corporate tribunals. We're just not going to do it. Right now they in a different trade agreement are being sued by Philip Morris, who's demanding hundreds of millions because of Australia's law on plain packaging of cigarettes. It's part of their tobacco health policy. And they're, the, the, Philip Morris International is using these secret tribunals, the corporate tribunals, to attack that law. So Australia's had it. They've really, they're not going to extend the authority for more companies to do that to them. So instead of a bunch of other countries saying, me too, I, I want to do that too, a lot of negotiators are running around basically saying, oh my God, I can't bring this agreement home if I'm bound to this corporate tribunal and Australia's not. But... The U.S. is saying they won't have an agreement unless the corporate tribunals are in there. So, hmm, well, maybe we just have to beat up in Australia. It's counterintuitive. So there, there is a bad dynamic where because comp- other countries don't want to be politically exposed if some other country does the right thing, and they don't, they all basically bully the countries that want to take the good initiatives. The point where that breaks down is where everyone is against the U.S., and so, like every other country is against the U.S., which is pushing a ban on the use of capital controls. All the other countries are against the U.S. and their crazy patent extensions for big pharma and medicines. So there are a couple of places like that. Or everyone is against the U.S. and extending the corporate tribunals to include natural resources con- uh, contracts and procurement contracts. But unfortunately, those are the rare instances. And the reason why is there hasn't been enough public debate. In the countries where this is a big public fight, for instance, New Zealand, the governments are being very careful. In the U.S., in other countries, it's been way too quiet. Is there more transparency of this process in uh, in the partnership countries uh, than in the U.S.? No, it's not a matter of more transparency. I hate to say it. It's a matter of the press. For instance, the mainstream media in Australia and New Zealand, the, you know, the, the national broadcasters, Australia Broadcasting Corporation, New Zealand NZTV, they have actually made the story top of the headlines front page. When that leak happened, it was the top story for three days in New Zealand about this investor wow. chapter. Or in Australia, it was a day of the top story. And that's, you know, every couple of months when there's a break or something leaks or something lunatic is said by somebody about this negotiation, 
it becomes a big story. Just in the U.S., totally locked out. Well, somebody's got to get uh, World Net Daily uh, to write up an email about this so that uh, it makes it onto Fox and eventually uh, the rest of them follow in some respect. Because if there's, um, I mean, th- this is, th- there seems to be something in here for uh, everyone of every ideological stripe uh, to have a a problem with. Uh, and obviously it's, uh, it- it's, it's a massive problem. There's no way yeah. to know what the timeline is here, is there? I mean, because... Well, the, the big push, you know, the U.S. is pushing, pushing, pushing. They wanted to sign before the election because they know after the election there'll be much more attention to everything right. non-election. Right. And they know that many of the base groups, unions, environmental groups, who are really mad about this as they've started to learn what they've been up to at the Obama administration, also do not want to make a big public hoo-ha about it if it would undermine the chances, if it would make right. it more likely that there'd be a Republican president. So they realize they've got this small window between now and November where they can either lock this down or, heaven forbid, it would be subject to public debate. So I always say our job as citizens is to keep our mouths wide open. So we need to all make a big fuss about this because politically, if it gets just a little bit of sunshine and debate, you know the Obama administration, the campaign, the White House political operation is basically going to say this, this has got to stop. They don't want it to become a liability, and because it's under the radar, it hasn't. But just talking about it, getting the word out, talking to your members of Congress about it. I mean, here's an example. Two members of Congress started a letter three weeks ago after this business happened with Wyden being denied the tax and said, you know, this is outrageous. We want to see this agreement, and by the way, it sounds like it's heading in the wrong direction. They got 135 members of the House of Representatives on in three weeks, uh. alert to the president. So it's just a matter of raising the alert, raising the alarm. And on TradeWatch.org, our website, there's not just information, but lots of action ideas okay. and also ways to connect to people locally who are already working on the agreement. Because one of the most important things is just to go to your member of Congress, your House member, and your two senators, who all have lots of open office hours during the summer, to where you can just pop in on a weekend and or call or email and just say, hey, you know there's this agreement that's almost done, three years in the making, would rewrite large swaths of law. I'm particularly upset about fill in the blank. Can you tell me, because certainly you've seen it, what the hell is in there, and can you send me a copy? You know, most members of Congress have never asked to see it. They assume they can get it. We need to actually make them go through the process of trying and being rejected so they realize they're shut out too. That's so- the first step. Tradewatch.org, it, 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 uh, for people who want to get involved in this. I mean, it really is sort of a stunning dynamic where uh, the the biggest uh, losers, I mean, I think to a certain extent everybody's a loser in this um, in this deal, but the, the biggest institutional losers, uh, unions and um, other organizations that could have the most leverage – are sort of boxed in by this election in the same way that's also where they would get their leverage. So it's really important for people, I think, uh, to listen to what Lori suggests here and uh, head over to TradeWatch.org. Is there anything else we should know, Lori? Uh, well, the only thing I would finish by saying is citizen activism has successfully derailed crazy power grabs like this via trade agreement. So that free trade area of the Americas I mentioned the one we got published finally, after enough countries looked at in detail, parliamentarians in Brazil, activists in Jamaica, that agreement got to a situation where all the other countries said to the U.S., all right, we're either going to do something different that doesn't have these outrageous things in it that's really about trade, or we're not going to do it. And at that point, the U.S. government said, all right, well, we're going to do what the corporations say, so we're not going to do it. We need to, and that agreement's never happened. And that's happened to three or four agreements. So we need to get the situation where it's either a choice between a different kind of fair deal or it's no deal. And we have done it before. It's actually something that works. Sunshine on this problem really makes the difference. So if anyone is thinking, oh, this is the worst thing ever, I'm never going to be able to do something, we've won this over and over, and now is the time to get going. Lori Wallach, uh, the website is tradewatch.org. We have all the links up at majority.fm, and I appreciate your taking the time to tell us about this today.